Hi there, Carol Ziocas with Kimono Momo. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about one of my favorite subjects and some of my favorite summer projects, uh, deconstructing kimono. This is something that I got to do live at a convention many, many years ago and had a great audience for that. If you were in the audience, it was fantastic to look out over a full room and see everybody ooing and aahing over a really ugly kimono that I got to tear apart in front of all of you. Anyway, today I'm going to do the same thing. What I have, what I have is a little white dog. Oh, come here. Who is, who is asking for attention. You may have seen her on my vlog. This is Daisy. She looks like a Muppet. I'm going to put her down now. Daisy loves to sit on a kimono when I'm taking it apart. And today the kimono I'm talking about is actually a cotton kimono, not a yukata, but a woven katsuri kimono. So this would have been worn as daily wear, not just, not just summertime wear. But this particular one is kind of stiff, not really something I would want to wear for summertime, but something that's a great summertime project to work on because cotton is cool and it's lightweight. And these are sewn together with generally thick cotton thread, hand sewn, so they're easy to tear apart. It's a quick project. And by quick, I mean under two hours. A silk kimono properly hand sewn takes at least two hours to deconstruct if you want to do it right without ripping the fabric. A cotton one like this, it's a little easier. There's a little more, um, it's a little more forgiving. And if you rip, you can still use it in a project. If you're going to take one apart to use as a project, which I often do, then there are some steps you might want to know about. It's actually really easy. The only tools you're going to need are a seam ripper, which you probably already have in your sewing kit. I hope you do. Possibly, but I almost never use these anymore, pliers. I use jewelry pliers because I was a jeweler for 10 years. And um, scissors. Scissors are always good. I use kuraha, which are the little Japanese stips. These are actually my personal pair. I have the ones from Clover if you are looking for an inexpensive pair of kuraha. They make wonderful, wonderful thread snips and they're exceptionally sharp. Anyway, so what this is, is a full size kimono, and I don't have the space to really hold up all of it here in the camera, but you notice there's a white lining that runs along the back and shoulders, it's sort of to catch the sweat. And at the very bottom, and I just dropped it, at the very bottom, there is this lovely pad, and you can see this one is soiled or stained. The sort of, I call it a butt pad, that's not the name for it. I actually do know the name for it, and I wrote it down and I left it on the other side of the room. So I'll catch up with that in a minute. What I like to do when I'm tearing one of these apart is I generally start at the collar. Now every one of these has little secrets. You see this one has a seam here. That's unusual. That means that this collar at some point was repaired. And the collar really is quite stained. It's a little yellowed along the edge. When I take this collar out, and it feels really thick, there will be fabric in there. That's always a little hidden surprise. What did they stuff in there to give it that full body feeling so that the collar would stand up straight when it was being worn? So I'm going to take my seam ripper in hand and find out. You may be wondering, why on earth would I want to tear one of these apart? Well, I get a lot of these, and I do tear a lot of them apart. You can get them in markets in Japan very inexpensively. You can get them here in the United States at flea markets, garage sales, Goodwill. Uh, donation sites get them fairly frequently, depending on where you are. A lot of families who have had um, Japanese foreign exchange students, the exchange student will sometimes give one as a gift, and the family never knows what to do with them. So they just sort of languish in a box in the closet for 20 years. So what I'm suggesting is if you have one that you don't think you're ever going to wear and you don't know what to do with it otherwise, and if you're the crafty sort who likes to tear things apart and make new things out of them, this is an option for you. You get a view while you're tearing it apart as to how it was made and can better understand what goes into making these. Every kimono and yukata... Um, Yukata actually not so much now. They're, they're very often sewn in China and they can be machine sewn, but traditionally have been hand done and hand tailored to the particular individual. This was not an off the rack garment ever. This is a garment where either you had it tailored for you 
from the very beginning, or you bought a roll of fabric yourself, and you can see the rolls behind me. Buy a roll of fabric and sew it up for yourself at home according to your own measurements. People ask an awful lot, why is the fabric so narrow? You caught on kimono fabric on these bolts, uh, typically about 14 inches, 36 centimeters wide. On average, it can be wider, it can be smaller. The older you get, the older bolts tend to be narrower, newer bolts tend to be wider because the average Japanese person is taller than they were 50 years ago, so in order to make a larger garment, you need wider fabric. Why was it so narrow to begin with? It has to do with the looms that they were originally woven on. Backstrap looms are not very wide. It's a loom where you're sitting and you've got it tied to something else and it straps around the back and you're weaving something that's about as wide as you. And a sleeve, one sleeve, I'll show you. That is one loom wide. And each panel of a kimono, and it's a four panel wide garment, if you look at it from the back, is going to be a narrow panel. One of these bolts makes one kimono, or yukata. So what I'm gonna have when I'm done with this is enough fabric to roll it right back onto a bolt and have a bolt of fabric again. Kimono is a really versatile garment. It's something that to be properly washed must be completely disassembled, washed, um, I haven't actually seen it done other than pictures, I admit, but I believe it is laid out on boards to get it nice and straight and stiff again because you want that crispness and then uh, dried that way so that it is even and straight and you can move things around like this, this piece that I'm tearing off the, lip, the collar right now. That was originally probably somewhere else. And this, this particular piece, garment, may have been handed down. So it may have been resized and reshuffled and reconfigured. And I'm seeing all kinds of differences in the coloration between the part of the collar that was hidden and the upper part of the back. You can see the collar is very blue. The upper back is very white. So that would have been sun bleached over time and wear. This uh, dye would have been fading out over the years, as it does. And I haven't quite gotten to my secret surprise in the collar yet. I'm gonna keep digging on that. Okay, so a little bit later here, actually not much. I'm just starting to see a fabric that's inside the lining of the collar. And it's, it's at a point where I can just tease it apart with my hands instead of taking every stitch out with the seam ripper. So I'm gonna pull carefully Feel for resistance if you start feeling the fabric really pull back or if you hear ripping noises, time to stop. But this one is tacked together nicely. So there we go. Inside the collar is yukata fabric or maybe from a tenugi. Tenugui? I forget my Japanese because I don't get to speak it very often. <sighs> Between tanugi and tanugui, one is an animal and one is a cloth, I think. There we go. This is folded up cotton, which I can use for another project. And there's probably enough of it. It may be white enough, I think so, to use for the project that I'm going to show you at the end of the video. And it's something I'm very excited about and we'll be offering as a pattern, as a free pattern. And that's part of what this is all about, is preparing fabric so that if you're interested in that pattern and you want to buy fabric to use for it, I will have um, these fabrics available for you as a little pre-pack so you can make the project the way I did. So what I'm going to do now is continue tearing apart with my hands and a seam ripper because there are parts, oh, that's a key note. When you've done a lot of these, and I've done several dozen of these over the last few years, um, places you don't want to rip because it will stop. 
right underneath the arm, the way it connects um, a kimono for, for a woman's kimono specifically, will be open under the sleeve, under the arm. So there's an opening there and an opening on the body as well. I'm sorry, this is hard for me to show, not having like a big setup behind me. When I do a lecture, I get to hang everything. What that means is because that, that area gets so much pull, they tend to put a lot of reinforcing stitches to connect the sleeve. And I very often start with the sleeve instead of the lapel, just so that I can have a bite-sized portion to work with, or I can take with me and pick for the next half hour if I'm going to be sitting somewhere or watching TV, which actually I don't watch TV because we got rid of it when we built all of this. Anyway, sleeves can be very satisfying to tear apart. They go pretty quick. But do watch out for the portion, those thick stitches that are connecting the sleeve to the body. Aha. Sleeve is done. Fun fact about sleeves. Before World War II, married women and unmarried women both had longer sleeves. An unmarried woman has the longest sleeves. They dangle because, well, she's... She doesn't have children. She doesn't have to worry about where those sleeves are going to get grubby fingerprints on them. A married woman has shorter sleeves. And up to World War II, even married women's sleeves had more length than they do today. During the war, during the austerity years that were everywhere, not just Japan, but United States, Europe, everywhere else, women cut back on how much fabric they used. So less yardage on the bolt, shorter sleeves. It was a good place to conserve. So you see a lot of post-war sleeves, but also working class sleeves especially, which is what this is, is working class garment. Um, there we go. Are short. So this is a short sleeve. This is something that somebody would have probably worked in. So it didn't need to be long. Long would be silly and impractical. But during the war, sleeves were shortened. So sometimes you'll find a garment or a sleeve, especially in a silk kimono, where the sleeve looks really short, but once you unpick the stitches, you get another couple of inches of fabric that were hidden in there. And that sleeve was modified to look more socially acceptable during the war, more austere than it originally was. Because why cut the fabric if you don't have to? Just fold it in and, and go with it. And in case you've ever wondered about those round corners, those are not cut. Those are gathered. This is full of lint. But the gathering stitches here, there's usually about three rows of stitches that pull those gathers together. So I'm going to tear those apart. And there's a big, big ball of lint. That's not at all unusual, to be expected. All of this is going to be washed. I wash my cottons in, um, in the machine with very mild detergent because this was something somebody wore and there's going to be dirt and dust and lint and it's, it's clean when I get them. Generally speaking, they're pretty clean. Sometimes there's stains or bits of whatever stuck to them, but usually pretty good condition. I'm going to take every little teeny tiny stitch out of here and when I'm done my trick is to run my fingers along the seam edge, look for threads, look for stitches, feel for knots, pick every little piece of thread out that I can find. And that way, if I go all the way through both sides once, once this is unpicked, that way I know it's completely done. You don't want to pull something out of the washing machine and find it still has a closed seam and then have to pick it out and then have more lint. Get everything done you can ahead of time. Have it all finished. That way you can throw it in the washing machine. I have a pile of unchecked and checked garment pieces so that as I go through, and this will take roughly two hours, as I go through I can see what I've done, what needs to be done, and invariably I'll miss one or two stitches somewhere, but I try to pick them all through. This is a project that is easy enough for children to do if you feel safe 
letting them have a sharp object. Uh, it's something that doesn't take much focus. If you're good with your fingers, you can just feel your way along. This is something that is kind of satisfying if you like tearing things apart, which I think we all do at some point. Plus, when this is done, I'm going to have a whole new bolt of fabric to play with. So I'm excited to see how this turns out. I have another one that I picked apart yesterday that's already in the washing machine waiting to go. So I will let you see how this works out and give you some pointer pointers as I go.